myself, Swar. We have our honored guests of Popey, Max Ketchum, Doughboy, Card, and Hangman. Before we even get started, I just want to go ahead and give a, give a quick shout out to Red Bull. Uh, they are helping us a lot, you know, through this collaboration, getting us maximum exposure in the uh, drought that is the Smash 4 climate right now. But going into it really quickly, I just wanted to run through the list. It's what we're going to be talking about today, just so you have a heads up. Uh, 30 through 21 for the fifth season of the PGR has been released, starting with Ken at 30th, Wrath at 29th, Zenodo at 28th, SDX at 27th. Tone at 26th, Mars at 25th, Kamame at 24th, Raito at 23rd, Wadi at 22nd, and Isem at 21st, there with the Pika plushie. But moving now into the introductions of everybody, how is everybody on this roundtable feeling tonight? Doing good. Doing Chilling. pretty good over here. Pretty, pretty good myself. Chilling. Okay. Just woke up. Just woke up. Yeah, we are working with two different time zones here. Actually, multiple. Although everyone here is East Coast except Popey. Uh, but shout out to Popey for being able to join. Uh, really quick, we can just go around. Uh, tell me who you are and what you're about currently as we make our way around through the layout. We'll start with Popey and with Hangman. Uh, Popey, how you doing, man? What's been going on? Well, aside from like uh, doing the PGR right now, uh, major focus of mine right now has been doing League of Legends, so I'm going into this just as uh, I'm going into this pretty surprised at some of the rankings, but I still expected some of this, so it's 50 50. But I'm really excited to see a lot of the players I'm a fan of rise a lot this season. Cool, all right, yeah. I mean, obviously, being as you know, one of the chief article writers for. The PGR your work is greatly appreciated, and people get to see the articles this time around pop off. So thanks for that. Uh, going into Max, how you been, man? Great players ball this weekend, right? Uh, yeah, I was just going to talk about that real quick. Just finished running a Northeast Invitational that, of course, Suar was at. Hangman was at. Got some sick commentary in there from both of them. But yeah, guys, uh, just looking forward to Smash Ultimate, tying up the rest of the few months left with Smash 4. Got Let's Make Moves on the Horizon and just uh, collegiate stuff as well. Shout out to CSL. Awesome. Yeah, CSL putting in the work for Collegiate Smash. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people are just really happy to be a part of that as well, seeing that as a potential pathway in college as the tone for esports starts changing. Uh, so, yeah, best of luck to you. And uh, we do have Doughboy joining us as well from New England. How have you been, man? Doing good. Um... Just a little about myself is that I've been a New England Smash player for a long time now and did some stuff with production. I helped with Big Blue Esports and running Shine. And now I'm going to be working with Beyond the Summit. And we'll see if I can get an Ultimate Summit going once I'm there. That's kind of my life goal at the moment. Yeah, uh, Shine, a staple of the New England scene. And you've definitely been uh, instrumental along with the Big Blue Esports staff headed by Shi Dang and a lot of other friends and making that happen. So glad to have you on. And uh, you'll be at Shine this year again, I assume? Yep, yeah, I'll be working this time with Beyond the Summit, obviously, yeah. to do the main stage stuff. Hype, hype. Hey, we got CSL finals there, too. <laughs> oh, really? Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it seems like all roads meet at uh, Evo, SmashCon, and Shine all in a row. So Summer Smash will definitely be packed. As yeah, well for real. Now. Uh, but yeah, we also have a uh, card joining us from, Hello. from uh, Georgia. What part of Georgia, Georgia. are you from? Uh, Atlanta. Most when when people talk about Georgia Smash, it's mostly like within a thirty minute radius of Atlanta. Okay, hype, hype. And how you been, man? What what have you been? About? Uh, I'm good. Uh, I've been running tournaments out of Georgia for two and a half years. Uh, we unfortunately, other than Momocon and DreamHack, uh, I and Georgia have been like pretty quiet as far as big tournaments go. Mm -hmm. But recently, I've gain the resources and the stream to be um, a part of Recursion, and Recursion has been predominantly Melee, been able to put Melee on the map. Now we're soon to be putting Smash 4 and hopefully making Georgia a more relevant region in Smash Ultimate. Mm -hmm. uh, I, yeah, I'm just a event coordinator and a streamer. 
Yeah, I mean, don't under, undersell yourself too hard. <laughs> Those are definitely thankless jobs, and especially in a region that, you know, sometimes vies for that main stage presence. Uh, East Coast has, you know, for at least Smash 4's lifetime, uh, been struggling to meet the same sort of scale that West Coast has been showing us, you know, with the sagas and other large scale events, of course, in the Southwest. So definitely not an easy thing to do in the East Coast, but I think things are set to blow up for Ultimate. So good luck to you. Same. Uh, Hangman, Tri-State native, how's it been? Uh, it's been great. I've been mostly focusing on my commentary uh, for this past year, but I've also helped with organizing a few events uh, here on Long Island. Uh, as you can probably tell from the background, I'm actually at Aeon currently, just using some of their tech to uh, be a part of this but i've also helped with uh production for smash sounds uh, an event that just recently passed for tri-state and hoping to get more involved with more productions as uh, smash 4 comes to a conclusion and ultimate opens up for all of us yeah smash sounds is an awesome crossover event with uh 2gg zone champ as well so i was really happy that you guys were able to put that on that that sort of crossover i think will be uh, a lot of the norm heading into Ultimate because as we know now, uh, with the viewership drought that's going on, it's kind of important to band together as opposed to sort of, you know, trying to do it all on our own. So props to you on that. Thank you. Awesome. So that's everybody. Uh, as chat starts to see what we devolve into, hold your questions <laughs> until the end because we're going to have a Q&A. But starting with just, you know, this uh monday right it seems like it's already been forever since uh you know 40 through 31 obviously with a lot being said on twitter and social media in general it's been it's been a week of a lot of stuff going on especially with the mpgr going for the melee side but uh opening into this week you know we do have 30 through 21 so you know going into just number 30 themselves you know we do have this uh, topic now of the Japanese showing up again in full force, but particularly Japanese that haven't traveled. So anybody have any strong thoughts on the number 30, which is, of course, Ken, uh, you know, lauded as like a top 10 player, even top 15 at his worst, you know, sitting at 30. Anybody have any strong thoughts on that? I thought it was really funny how I saw a few Twitter threads about Japan having too many PGR event and Ken obviously doing very well at all of those and everybody knowing that he's like top 20, top 15-ish player and he's down here at 30 yeah. despite that attendance. Yeah, I mean, not, not being able to go to the U.S. hurts, but at the same time, like he got a score of wins out in Japan. Anybody have anything else to say about that? Maybe on the contrary? I mean, maybe disappointed that he's at 30? Yeah, I'm actually like... pretty disappointed that he's at 30, but I think it's pretty understandable since even though he won like a few events in Japan and he placed well at the events he did at then, the overall amount of it at the events that he was at was still pretty low compared to his other peers like Kamei. Yeah, I mean, Umabura TAT getting first and third at Tokaigi 2018 and even fifth at EVO Japan are events that many people here would struggle to even get out of pools in. But, you know, as we saw by his X Factor, plus 12. I mean, people definitely put him in that top 20 range. Uh, you are going to add to that, Hangman? Yeah, I was actually just going to talk about the, the X Factor that he has. I feel like a lot of people didn't really follow that he didn't go outside of Japan too much in the passing uh, uh, ranking period. And people judged him based on how well he did during the 2GGC. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, he did fantastically during that period, but a lot of his uh, his wins and a lot of the kills that he accredited during this period was because of how well he did at home. So now we got a chance to see what it looks like with just his performances at home for the most part. And he still manages to, you know, keep up with the competitions. Even though 30 may seem a little low, it's pretty solid when you consider the fact that he didn't really travel outside of Japan. Yeah, and Japan being uh, referred to as a region is almost a crime in and of itself only because it's so big. I mean, people can tell you, like, you can take a train there for, like, five, six hours and still be in the same uh, area. But, you know, Ken coming out with wins on Choco, Kamame, Shiki, Shutone, and Void, when Void was over there, you know, that that's still something a lot of people would just even hope to manage in their entire Smash 4 career. Uh, any opinions going off on that, Max or Doughboy? Are you ready to move on to 29? How are we feeling? 
I was just going to say that it would be interesting not to, <laughs> I'm not trying to tell you to do more work, but if there was like a PJR, Panda Japan rankings, <laughs> then that's where we would see Ken really shine. And if you were to exclude all US events, but that's where it like, it's Panda Global. It is not that there, name there necessarily Japan. defines that, but yeah, Card, this is Card, you're going to add, sorry, really quick. There, there's the Japan PR. Yeah, there, yes. There is the Japan PR. Oh, we had someone leave. Perfect. Yeah, it was Max. Oh, okay. Um, so probably connection rip. Yeah, it's fine. yeah. Connection so, dead. Rip, rip in pieces. So he'll come back. Um, so it's funny you say that, double way because the Japan PR, uh, of course, would be on the global scale. Uh, interesting only because it would like kind of isolate the region. And the reason we kind of haven't gone into like a year, like a Europe GR or a sure. all that is just because, you know, th there's a lot of talent to be found, but at the same time, curating that poses a lot of issues in terms of like, you know, now this other region doesn't get represented and this region doesn't get represented. So, right. Yeah. And that's um, where it makes sense. Like the scale you're working at makes sense. And then like, obviously there's state PRs, there's region PRs. That's where I'm sure Japan has their version, but that would be interesting to, to reference here. Yeah, and you know, going off on that, like there, there, there is that situation where you're gonna have people going in and out of regions. All of a sudden, like, uh, you know, someone that like Komurakiri like competes more outside of Japan than in Japan. You know, um, so. Could be could be pretty crazy. Uh, but moving on to 29, you know we got Wrath. Uh, you know opening up with you, Card. Are you surprised by Wrath making it into the 30s despite a relatively low key season? Uh, no. Uh, Wrath has been actually talking about how consistent his placings have been in his top at MomoCon. Like he's been doing good this season. By all means, like. Honestly, I'm surprised his X Factor is this low, considering at the few events he's been at, he's shown up. He's performed one above the seed, two above the seed, three above the seed. He's just doing great. He has only lost like one or two locals in the past two seasons. Um, cause then he's been more active at locally because his Wii U fried from a recent thunderstorm. I think that was around Momocon, but he's still like showing up. Yeah, and Wrath has always, you know, been lauded as that player that. Low key in bracket, low key in tournament, you know. But that Sonic, like, still showing up, you know. Highest ranked Sonic on the PGR. That is, that is a really <laughs> hot take. Only considering the fact that, you know. Besides that, Como. Yeah, yeah, which we've seen less of, but of course. Any other impressions on Wrath? Um, I like that they mentioned the um, the bayonetta that he's had on the side to supplement his Sonic because I feel like a lot of people just forget that he has that. And it was definitely a notable factor for how he managed to play so well at the events he did go to. Because even though he didn't go to that many, like, he really made an impact on the events where he was there. Yeah. And, and Max, maybe you could speak a little bit more to this, but, like, being a solo main in this meta right now is suboptimal just, like, from the onset, right? I mean, there's just so many matchups, we've advanced so many things, and, like, you have to have, like, some sort of top-tier pick in your pocket, right? Yeah, I think Bayonetta is a really good complement to Sonic. We see a couple other players run this combo, like Juan from Mexico. Uh, Sonic struggles against Fox. Bayonetta is pretty good at that matchup. Same could be said for Cloud. Not really terrible matchups against Bayonetta for them, but certainly better than just going into it with Sonic. Um, I, too, am surprised that Wrath was on the PGR at all because I hadn't heard too much from him. But um, like it was just said right now, like he made... A pretty meaningful impact at all those events he didn't place below top 16 got some good wins in the process mr r that and fatality those are like you know nearing the single digits they're going to be in the the teens uh, i would predict we'll talk about that soon um but yeah man definitely a very solid player overall very young he's got a promising career ahead of him but you can see that people were not terribly confident in him either with the uh, negative 10 x factor and if you look at like his set count versus top 50 as opposed to Ken's, you know, you can see the discrepancy um, and how Ken was really hurt by inactivity overseas. Yeah, it's it's difficult because even though these, you know, rankings brand people as like top 50 in the world, like there's a lot of context that needs to be understood as well, which not all the player cards can capture. And like luckily for 
the Japanese players that we were able to showcase, you know, we made the necessary edits to really highlight the tournaments they attended, like the B and C tiers, which by the way, this season really differed from the last because with only two A plus tiers and seven A tiers, like 80% of this PGR was B and C tiers, which beforehand was much different because all the events were huge. So you had less of those like big events to really boost you, but being able to edit the player cards to show like, okay, this is this is their results in Japan. These are how they're relative, as opposed to having nine blank spots. You know, at least at least help the case. But you know, I definitely see that like, yeah, I mean, a along with like solo maining in this meta, like even a top tier such as like Sonic, which many would argue, I mean, by now he's like top tier, high tier, like very relevant matchup, right? Maybe he's not your top five, but like. At the same time, there's matchups that are still undesirable for him, and we saw Wrath at least make that change up. So good on him. Uh, Doughboy, anything to close on that, or do you want to go ahead and move on to 28? I think mostly just what what Max was saying. Like you look at that X factor of minus 10, like it is a bit surprising. And apparently, like I'm more surprised too. Like I'm maybe about surprised as Max was, because I would have predicted an X factor of like minus a lot more than 10 sure um but that's where you know you have to consider like look at that those placings like those are all extremely good and it makes you wonder if he had gone to let's say even two or three more of those events like would he be in the teens you know like it's it's just it makes you think about the whole thing where it's like what if everyone went to all these events like then was what, what does the top 10 look like what does the top 20 look like it'd be a totally different scene yeah, there, there's the reoccurring issue every season of how to accurately rank uh, players that don't attend too much and maybe make like a tiny splash or don't attend anything in the States like Japan or even some like Canadian slash Mexican players. And right. it always shows up in 21 through 50 because that's like where you try to make the most sense out of like all these results. So I'm definitely right. with you on that. Yeah, it's likely, I guess it's true. It's likely the top 20 or so are the players that have gone to everything just by the fact that sponsors, if, teams, if, yeah, ability. sponsors, teams, ability, yeah, if they're that good, it's probably because they're going to events and that hey. also helps them win more events. It's sort of a snowball effect in a way. You know what? It makes uh, a lot of sense that you just mentioned Mexico. I kind of want to talk about that perhaps later, but um, we'll come back to that. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, no problem. Uh, but moving right along, I mean, I think, yeah, like being able to attend events in general is like super important. But, you know, we live in a time with not a standardized like season in terms of like these are the tournaments you have to go to and whatnot. And again, like with Smash on the come up, it's always like debatable over like, you know, Evo's coming up this weekend. But at the same time, some Smashers don't support Evo and instead they want to go to Smash Con. But then other people don't want to go to Smash Con because it's more of a con than like a high stakes tournament. It, it all depends. But they're both majors in our in our eyes and they're both equally important. So, you know, the debate will continue. But here at 28th, we have the five time PGR Zenodo with the ever present Morose picture. Uh, personally, pick that one out. I think, I think it really highlighted uh, his play, but yeah, any thoughts on so Zenodo? Tight in this picture. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, had a great like you said, Zenodo's always there. Yeah, I mean, five time PGR Zenodo, five time PGR Fallen. I mean, Zenodo, does anybody know Zenodo personally that could speak more on him? Do not. I don't know why he disappeared if that's what you're getting at, man. <laughs> you do know or don't know? I, I don't, I have no idea. But well, I do know that, you know, even in his absence and a relatively quiet season in terms of how much stuff he went to, uh, this guy put up some huge wins. Putting up one on Leo especially was huge at uh, Midwest Mayhem. That's your son. Then, yeah, exactly. I, I have to give credit where it's due. And then Captain Zach, that's another top 10 level win. Elegant, we saw, is not present on 21 to 30, so I'm only assuming that he is higher light and same thing and then mars ranked a little bit above him like this guy has wins on so many people over him um and if you look man two a tier appearances and three c tiers so zenodo showing that even with the uh, favoritism toward high attendance in the pgr algorithms he still is a serious contender and he can make you know enough strides that the few things he does attend would put him here all the way at 28th which is really impressive
Yeah, and I do want to point out that social media consistency of Twitter, Twitch, and YouTube all being slash Zenodo or at Zenodo. It's always hype, mm-hmm. you know, getting getting your brand consistent across multiple platforms. I think he's been the only one to do it along with Locus <laughs> and uh, Nairo. So props to him. But yeah, Zenodo kind of winces when people or like cringes when people say that he's vanished. I mean, he, he's just like playing in region. He's active in region. But again, people want to see that out of region performance, that record. So, you know, props to him. And of course, like highest placing Diddy, it seems. Solo main. I feel That's like so weird. Testament. to you. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Hang that. I feel like it's a testament to just how good of a player he is that he's managed to stay, stay so consistent despite not having traveled to too much, but still being able to outperform the competition where he does go to. Mm-hmm. And then he, as we were just discussing the idea of a solo main and how difficult it is to solo main in the current meta, sticking around with Diddy Kong of all characters and really proving that this character can get pushed to this limit at so few situations it just goes to show just how skilled he is with this character yeah yeah and double you're going to answer to the solo diddy appearing this high or this low rather yeah it's it's still funny to me because i guess like in a way part of like the way smash 4 has been branded in my memory was like the first year and how everything grew so quickly and then the meta started to like solidify a little more not that it's even static now but that's when a lot of things were defined So when I think of Diddy, I sometimes will still think of, I I mean, obviously Zero, like, but now we have to think about uh, Zero, like, not being around and, like, I don't, like, it's just such a, a brain F for me, (laughs) like, like, highest placing Diddy, I read that, I'm like, wait, what? I'm like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, and, like, it's obvious, like, everyone knows that, but it's still such a strange variable, and you think, like, Diddy's such a great character you'd expect to see more but then you sit down and think you're like wait maybe not like yeah would, would all of you yeah. put diddy in your top five right now off the cuff dude i i would put diddy possibly second best uh i think I, I wanted to point this out too from the reddit <laughs> thread uh people are like oh diddy's not that good zero really carried the character that hard but i mean if you knock off the top whatever of a character top one or two players like yeah, what is real. that character looking like? You know, it, it really seems to boil down to the fact that like the best players are going to play who they want. You know, like yeah, take them away, and obviously the character suffers. Like Diddy Kong, not a character that I see as like extremely appealing to people to play um, for a lot of reasons. <laughs> I mean, that I actually love. I love playing Diddy. Honestly, he's one of my favorite characters to play in Smash Four. Hey, play fighting him, or play but, as. Play <laughs> as. Um, okay, okay, he's okay. super fun. You can do a lot of stuff with him, but maybe not everybody agrees. He's kind of like a, a basic brawler character with a projectile. You know, he's not like Cloud, who just by virtue of being in the game is impressive, right? Um, okay. Did he's simple? He's he's like Sheik almost, but without like the flashiness. And I think Sheik is a character who's kind of discouraging to play. So I, I just think that it just so happens that most of the best players in the world don't use Diddy Kong, right? Rather than Diddy is not that good of a character. That's why he bottomed out at 28th on the tier list okay. if you look at all the characters above him and you put them in a list there's no way diddy is you know that placement on the tier list it would probably be like 11th or 12th maybe even lower well you so, mean like 28th on the pgr not 28th on the tier list right because i don't uh, know if that's it's... no, no what then, i'm saying yeah is, and then matching that to a tier list right oh, if okay. you put all the all the characters of players who are ranked above him on the pgr yeah, all of these will, 27 which be cool yeah. to see. Yeah. <laughs> right right so there are probably you know 10 to 15 characters in that category they're not better than diddy it's you can't just say like that's why i hate tier lists being purely based on tournament results like there could be a really hard character in a game that's very good and nobody wants to play them because it's difficult and inconsistent but someone's really good at high peaks with them so i don't know man i mean obviously like zero is the best player in the world with diddy kong are you really going to say that like he was such an outlier that you take him away and diddy's like not top five all of a sudden hell no Character's right. ridiculous. Look at Shoyo James. He just he wins everything in Jersey. And Angel, like, we just had a tournament where they were the top two. Bayonetta was banned, granted, but I don't think any Bayos were going to beat them from our region anyway. Like, I don't know. The character's still crazy good. Okay. Any disagreements on that before we move to the next one? No disagreements. I feel like just because the character isn't well represented in the current active meta doesn't really reflect how good the character is stands alone. Yeah. Like Diddy, Diddy Kong is a monster. Diddy Kong needed to be put away. And the fact that the highest standing is at 28 is at least a good showing for 
where the meta is going. Like Diddy Kong has amazing tools. They just don't match up to how Smash 4 is played in the com current competitive environment, I would say. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I think I think we can all sustain that. Um, you know, it is it is kind of weird. I mean, like huh. two years ago to now, who's in the spotlight at those top eight on the graphics, the streams, the Reddit <laughs> result pages? Like, it's a trip. It's a trip. And obviously, like. With Zenodo being the highest placing solo Diddy right now, it, it definitely leaves a lot to sort of wonder as like how we'll close out this game. Like people had Diddy as their number one until Bayonetta more or less became more prevalent, but at the same time, like still people like Max juggle him and like their top three, top two even. So we'll see how that progresses. Honestly, um, Sorry, yeah, I, I honestly am surprised that there aren't as many like rising Diddy Kong players because he does seem good in the meta. He has arguably the best matchup with Bandit. That's like kind of controversial, opinion, but you do opinion. see people picking up Diddy Kong specifically for Bayonetta and all these top eight results graphics. Bayo, Bayo, Bayo. You, I'm just, and I guess one of his wins is kind of representative of that with Captain Zack, but. Maybe there could be a, a young Diddy Kong player making his mark at the very end of the game. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I wouldn't discount it at this point. But, you know, uh, in the spirit of Smash 4 meta and development, uh, we'll see. So moving on to the next one, SDX. You know, Hangman, I know you got some stuff to say, but SDX blows <laughs> the composition out of the water entering at the midway here at 27th. You know, 7th Hyrule Saga, 9th Gommel, 33rd Frostbite, 17th Smash and Splash. Uh, pretty good spread on the top 50, and an X Factor that seeks to underrate him. Hangman, how about you tell us a little bit more about him, along with Max, who, you know, obviously this is like your tri-state brethren. So, SDX hailing from Buffalo. Before we just steal him as tri-state solely, it's, it's worth pointing that he also went to a good amount of Canadian events. He's really far north of New York. And yeah, Canadian he's more Canadian or Toronto than here. Yeah, like Canada <laughs> oh. can claim him if they want. They they can contest for that because a lot of the action in New York happens much further south, where like tri-state like geographically meets. Like a lot of New York City, Long Island, Joy Westchester, all of that. Once it connects to Jersey, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, when they all come together, that's where a lot of the uh, more well-known action in tri-state occurs. SDX is far from that. He's like four or five hours out, possibly more, depending on how like deep into Buffalo he is. Dang. So when you look at him representing Tri-State, you also have to consider that he's getting a lot of his practice off of wherever he can in Canada, wherever he can in northern New York, and also Wi-Fi. It's also worth noting, he's only been playing Smash 4 for about a year. He's been <laughs> active competitively within about the halfway point of, pardon me, of the, uh, the current PGR quarter that just passed wow so, like a, a year very... like starting like picked up the controller and learned smash 4 or a year like entering events out of state uh entering events in general for Dang. about a little bit uh less than a year just a little bit less okay <laughs> max any words on that uh yeah again i would say sdx should be identified more with the toronto scene than the new york city scene by a long shot buffalo is like 90 minutes from there or less um huh yeah, so I met him at a Canadian event. I didn't know that he was even an American player. And a lot of Buffalo people go up there, like I modders. Um, I think they have a Lucas whose name is True Blue, not to be confused with True the Blue one from Sonic. Florida. Yeah. Yep. Um, but either way, yeah, uh, SDX is a monster man, and he's a young kid. I think he just graduated high school, or he's a junior or something. And let's go. I keep saying it: the children nice. are our future. Someone actually like criticized my commentary for often mentioning like when a player is young, but I think it's important in the narrative because. You're seeing people like, you know, who we used to perceive as the, the new blood and they're starting to reach their peaks of play and sort of start to taper off. And then you're seeing, you know, the new blood do it themselves. Um, so, yeah, SDX, super strong. I would not have given him a low X factor. I would have actually like probably expected. But, he, but he's like the lowest of low keys. In fact, like we couldn't find a single photo of him uh, <laughs> until we actually pulled it from a VOD, but, you know, it was a really high quality VOD, so thanks for 2GG for taking that, but at the same time, like, this guy has very, very minimal presence, which isn't a bad thing or necessarily a good thing, but, like, he just snuck up on a lot of people, you know? Just speaks to how fast he got good. If yeah. I yeah. Sort of, yeah, and to the average viewer, he's pretty much uh, coming from nowhere. Yeah. Hmm. 
That's a good point. Yeah. Reminds me of Awadi. Honestly, Awadi like kind of came out of nowhere in early 2016. Pound was one of his first tournaments, if I recall correctly. Pound and he, was his first. It was his first, and he got 33rd. Wow. I think. Well, yeah. he had played for a long time online, and uh, he technically was a veteran by status. But yeah, in terms of offline events, Awadi yeah. was basically unheard of. And that and that's a really good point. Two two points that rather like you talking about new blood we got to like you know really acknowledge that but also acknowledge old blood potentially falling behind and not to name any names but as, you know as the new blood kind of presses on the old blood has to keep up and we have seen brawl vets melee vets or just smash vets in general in the current meta or even just in general in smash 4 uh have their work cut out for them because you can't count on natural talent anymore with like you know tech videos being so accessible matchup videos being everywhere like every and and Wi-Fi, you know, a tool that many would discount, but if it's not Wi-Fi and it's locals or Smash Fest, so there's definitely like you know a lot to look forward to, and it's not like this season is ending with just like a bunch of oh yeah, of course, like it's gonna be these 50 people, tons of surprises still. Uh, but the other thing too is like just speaking to like when a Smasher becomes known, I'd argue is pretty much when you get that sick Twitch clip on like a top player. Like I know that Wadi competed at pound, but he didn't really exist for anybody until, you know, he was pulling off disables into up smash as like Abadago started that, you know, at that same pound. And like, you know, I don't know about you all, but like I've recognized like some players don't get like the credit they deserve until like they're pulling it off on the main stage, which of course, I'd agree with, but at the same time, like some people have been playing for months, and like you know, Captain L is another example. Like, he puts up so much work, but like until he got like that stream time, people didn't really know who he was. You know, I'm really glad yeah. that Wadi was mentioned because STX has said on multiple occasions how he's looked up to Wadi so much, and it makes sense, you know, YouTube player to YouTube player. But then having taken that set on Wadi was really what put STX on the uh, the world stage. So I feel like it's very fitting for a narrative. Well, cool. Yeah, I mean, sharing tech, sharing matchup advice, it's always good to have somebody that you can trust in that sense. And, like, we see that with other characters, too, having, like, this, like, hive mind of sorts uh, where they share that tech. Hive <laughs> mind uh, of but yeah. It's called a Discord. <laughs> yeah, Discord. Hive mind. But, yeah. Uh, going from SDX, though, any final notes before I move on? Yeah, I want to talk about records versus the top 50 again because I think SDX is, is particularly low to be in this um yeah. part of the ranking yeah i think if there's any learnings that the pg stats team probably walked away from pg rv5 with it's that that statistic is really important and it's really visible too you know what i'm saying like the mvd one i think is the most extreme example and then you also have people like ken who's positive against the top 50 and he's ranked 30th and then you have people like zidoto who basically fits right where he should be. I would say, you know, around 25 is theoretically where you should be having these 50% win rates. But um, again, there are so many more layers to this that like the general public who's prone to whining as quickly as possible doesn't see. Or just doesn't um, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, exactly. It, it, exactly. Many, so, so, many layers to it. So it's a great point, you know, and let's bring up MVD. Why not? Um, <laughs> you know, it, it would be something to sort of have the win rate because if you notice like the graphic is really balanced in terms of what it's displaying the most prominent feature on it ends up being the ranking uh 27 top left corner he's new right in sdx sdx's case then on the right uh in the same size font you have the placements and the set count x factor overall score which is again like standard like normalized so that you know that like you know sdx is sitting as like 59.9 out of 100 and it's only going to get higher when some of the top 41 through 50 dudes were sitting at like, you know, the high 30s, low 40s. But it's it's true, you know, like 712 is like, yeah, it's not it's less than favorable. And especially MVD is 1 in 11. But as we know now, with this 21 through 30 being revealed, MVD was 1 in 8 on the top 20. So again, like, how do you portray that in a way that people understand it? And also... Well betray the placements in a way that people don't value them too much. I mean, it's a question we're honestly grappling with every season. Right, of course. There's no panacea for this. You know, you guys kind of have to play with it every season and, and figure out what works and what doesn't. Uh, was it the PGR last season or was it perhaps SSBM rank that had a win rate on like... It was two seasons ago. Division? 
Yeah, yeah. Okay, we're top showed, 10 you know, and then top, top 50, 50 top yeah. 10, et cetera. Yeah, yeah I, I think that would be really telling as well. Maybe even have like win rate versus top 50 and then a subsection where it's like versus top 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, you so, know, and show like each of the strikes against them or, or points that they were putting up. So great point, but then we start to fall into the trap of spoiling the rest of it as these Very things true. happen out in Very two true. weeks. And that happened particularly with Wadi. Uh, I forgot what his set count was, but it said like against the top 10, he was like one in three or one in something. And so it gave only, away who one of the And the only was. person he had beaten notably that people were popping off about was Captain Zack at a glitch, mm. I believe, or some sort of Xanadu monthly or something. And so people like through the 51 through 50, for, sorry, 41 through 50 already deduced that Zack was part of the top 10. So then we run into like, now we're spoiling mm -hmm. the rest. So it's a balance, but I understand what you mean. And for XEX's case, like his losses are all like, quote unquote, great losses you know and obviously for mvd like being one and eight on the top 20 like that 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 bites you know so uh yeah you could maybe publish it after the full release or something to avoid spoilers but yeah i, I think that's we're like we're a we're really we're good we're way to um to shed some more light and give more transparency on the ranking system even though you're not technically doing anything extra uh you're just breaking it down a little bit for people who uh, might have some questions and i i don't know i think that's that's good overall but of course you guys like the mystique behind the PGR is a big part of why we're all gathering around the fireside, you know, for basically like a week and a half worth of reveals. Yeah, 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 definitely. So balancing out presentation, data, display, all that. Um, but without further ado, we do have 26, Shoe Tone. Any surprises there? Not for me, man. I wouldn't no? say particularly. Yeah, I mean, like, I feel like Shoe Tone hoping, is yeah. right where he belongs in this list. Okay. He did travel, so of note, Ninth Hyrule Saga, amazing. 25th at CEO, nothing to be upset about. Top 16 at Switch Fest, awesome as well. So he did make it to the US. So Popey, you agree pretty much he is where he should be? Yeah, he is where he should be based on the placements he's shown this season. I mean, he could probably have a higher peak if he uh, displayed what he did in previous seasons. But based on his showings for the past six months, I think he's right where he belongs. Yeah, we see wins like Abadango, like Kamame, Shiki, Kirihara, a win rate of 5 and 13, like Max was talking about earlier, being less than favorable, you know, 28% here. But we're also, you know, needing to think about the fact that many of those wins are at B and C tiers, which happened in Japan, which seek to sort of like count for less. You know what I mean? Like losing to someone at the big stage at Genesis or Halo Saga, you know, is going to hurt. But like at a B and C tier, you know, the, those are kind of part of like what you're doing, you know, so maybe not too much of a surprise there. I didn't see really anybody arguing about it today. Shutone's actually a crowd favorite as well. So that might have had something to do with it, even though he plays Olimar, but he does discussing stuff with Olimar. So props to him, you know. Um, but yeah, any any thoughts on Shutone that anybody wanted to get out before we move on to the I think. Card? I think I'm also going to like touch a little bit on the earlier discussion where um, what to show on the graphic, uh, how to properly convey why they got the spot they did. Uh, sometimes placings don't tell the whole story, and that's obviously like a cheesy yep. Yep. cliche statement. But Shutan lost to like Queek to get 25th at CEO. Yeah. He was, there, there he was, was pretty. There was that story, you know, with Tweak, like, the flight, this, starting and losers, the buzz giving up a seed. Like, there was a lot going on, right? There was a lot going on at yeah. CEO. Yeah, continue card, though. Um, but I feel like when Shutan came to the U.S., the players he lost to were, like, all of the caliber where he would place in top 16 at all of those tournaments if Tweak wasn't, like didn't get upset by Captain L. But of course he did, and that's how the placing happens. Um, Shutan in Japan was also pretty consistent, uh, especially since you always see Japanese results and they're pretty out of whack. Uh, but Shutan remained consistent in Japan, always like getting top 16. I think he placed outside of it once, but I'm not sure if it was a PGR event or not. Um, I can check it later, but yeah, I'm not too surprised by Shutan being number 26. I think that's pretty accurate. Okay, yeah. Uh, just to go around the entire uh, table, starting with Hangman, ending with Popey, just tell me, within the three, which one do you value the most? Consistency, placements, or wins? Take a second. If you had to choose one, again, this is like 
no impact to the rest of the discussion, but I just want to know where you are. Get a pulse. If you had to choose between consistency being the largest metric, wins or placements for your own interpretation of like results and stuff, which one would you pick of the three, starting with Hangman? Uh, for me personally, I would talk about wins, especially in the context of Smash for Wii U, just because by the nature of how this game goes and how active its competitive scene has been, even in this lull, so to speak, you'll find situations just as Card was bringing up where it took Tweak knocking uh, Chuton out at 25th at CEO. But that's in one of those situations that's lower in the bracket where even if, you know, say for instance, Chuton got that win at that placing, put Tweak down at 25th, that still is just as good of a win, whereas if he did it later on in bracket or even earlier, per se, sometimes you have to, like, step back, take for instance, uh, and just look at who beat who when. And at least to me, I feel like when you're looking at how powerful a player is or like how good they can play the game, you want to take into consideration who are they beating to prove that worth. Yeah. As opposed to how long have they been proving it or under what circumstances. All right. So we got placement or sorry, we got wins and where they happened, which is interesting because that's a twist that I wasn't expecting. But, you know, are you beating Tweak in round one of your pools as an upset and you come out on top or are you beating Tweak in top eight grand final side? So cool point there. Uh, card wins, consistency or placements. Wh which one would you choose over the rest? So I would usually choose wins, but it's just so hard to measure without a previous metric, right? Okay. Um, without having the placements or consistency, what exactly do those wins mean without like a super grand like sheet of records? Um, okay. But I still would say that wins is probably the most important as far as like rankings go. Okay. Doughboy, are you going to combo break or are you going to say wins? Combo breaker. Oh, okay. Kind of, kind of. So I think within the context of a particular season, wins take it. But I feel that if we all look back at Smash 4 when Ultimate comes out and think about who were the best Smash 4 players, I think that's where consistency is a bigger variable because you have to consider the changing meta. You have to consider, I don't know, just, just every variable within a four-year window becomes relevant and being able to take a win off of let's say sdx in 2014 compared to 2018 is extremely different okay. um and there might be a vice versa to that there's a certain player who dropped off a lot so within a season absolutely wins but i think for like you know who we look back at when ultimate comes out or just at any point in the future i think consistency granted it is about consistency of wins yeah um and of placements but i think consistency is the the long-term king variable but for a season wins sure so who are you losing to and how often are you getting upset at every top 32 or are you hardly ever losing like someone like the buzz uh to quote unquote randoms right okay. great point max wins consistency placements it's got to be wins man i think consistency is uh, something that comes from wins, right? And even if you are very inconsistent, picture a player who, very extreme example, gets a win on DeBuzz, Nairo, and Zero in one season, and then places 49th at everything else, or like doesn't make it out of pools. You would still evaluate that player's skill as very high because their peak is very high, right? And like, I would expect to see a player who scored those kinds of wins, at least on the PGR. Um, and, you know, placements are, are deceiving. Like, you could literally, for any reason, like, you know, your opponent, who's the third seed in the tournament, uh, in the round of 32, punches somebody in the face and gets ejected from the venue. You get a buy over them. <laughs> You're going to advance further in the bracket. Like, actually, are you talking from experience, man? You can actually, yes, no. Actually. Uh, you can actually <laughs> place higher than somebody uh, at a tournament by not even showing up if you were a high seed and, and you, like, had a buy. So... I'm going to say, yeah, placings are by far the least important. Consistency should matter. And there, I think there's already a metric to reflect that on the PGR in that you have um, the X factor. So 
if a player, you know, racks up wins on all these top 10 players, but they place like trash at everything else, then you can see that reflected in their low X factor. It's like, yeah, they technically, you know, racked up a bunch of wins, but we don't expect that great of things from them on a regular basis. Yeah, an X factor, again, inconsequential to the overall ranking, but it still helps us tell you and everybody else see the story of like, you know, Ken, easy example. He's 30th on the PGR this season. Ken lauded as a top five, top 10 player by people like uh, Mr. R, Zero, and other, you know, famous top 10 players of, you know, legacy stature. But we see here that he's 30th, but his X Factor puts him up 12 spots from that. And it's just unfortunately something that happens when, again, you don't get to travel and stuff. So great points made. We'll end it with Popey. Uh, placements, wins, consistency. What do you think? Uh, I said his headphones died. His headphones just died as you finished that sentence. Awesome. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just I'll just go off the thought saying that I I would agree. Uh, placements hardly ever tell the full story. Doubly limb brackets hardly ever tell the full story. Only because you know if you suffer that round one loss to a really freak situation, now you're in losers, and you can end prematurely because later in the bracket, Ally gets upset by Komoda at like frostbite, so now he's in your path, and then you end at you know 25th, 33rd, 49th. We've seen so many times in a tweet where blank and blank are battling for 49th, you know, because Como got upset early and Mars got upset early, you know, and it's just like, how is that? Like, how is that hype, you know? So definitely placements. And it's hard because you also can't ignore placements because people always remember who got first at CEO 2016. People always remember who got first at Civil War. People always remember, like, these first, second, third. So... It's difficult to like discount them entirely, but at the same time, the argument for like valuing places more is definitely there. I'd agree. Um, but hopping off that really long tangent, but I think you know great points were made. We do have your boy here, uh, Doughboy. We do have Mars at 25th. What? How does that make you feel? Knowing what you know about Mars, knowing what you know about his previous seasons, being 19th on V4, 14th on V3, uh, 15th on V2, and 13th on V1, making him now five-time PGR Mars. Right. So this is so I, you know as I'm going through this article um, on the Red Bull site, I'm scrolling down. I see Mars at 25, and at first there was like a little bit of surprise because he's always been below 20, but I think it makes sense. Um, I know that he's been traveling a little bit less. Um, and I know he still plays this a lot. Like locally, he's still wrecking house. Yeah. Um, and now it's interesting because he's, he's always, um, it's not that New England has been completely free for him, but now with light on the scene, it's very different. Yeah. Um, so most of like New England's history has been, I guess to make a very bad bad joke, dark because there was no light for a while, or at least not in the not not the strength that he I know not the not as strong as a player as he has been in yeah. the past year or so. Yeah, definitely. Um, when I was part of New England, no one likes seeing uh, the same player win all the time. It, yeah, <laughs> it kind of hurts the cred credibility of the scene. Kind of hurts the ability for that scene to gain major exposure. But once light really was able to go to toe to toe out of region and in region mm -hmm. with mars i mean that helps everybody overall um yep any other strong reactions to mars at 25th i mean i personally you know i feel for him not being able to travel being a free agent times are tough right yeah exactly it's it's a it's a bit of a times are tough thing um i know he's living with his girlfriend now and i mean he's just happy to be be doing what he's doing still and i don't think he's going to put too much weight on this ranking, I think he knows how good he is, and he's a very, very confident person. And you can kind of see that in his play, where he actually will occasionally show his cockiness, where he starts taunting and all of that. Um, but I don't think he's going to personally be shook. I think he'll he probably looked at it and went, just nodded his head and was like, "Yeah," and that was like probably it. And then he closed out of his browser. <laughs> Dude, that's um, definitely exactly what he. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'd put money on that. <laughs> yeah, Mars is pretty chill. Yeah, and um, I think. I don't know if it was for V4 or V3, but I remember when it came um, when it came out, we were either at a tournament, might have even been a major, and I'm not sure why specifically, but he asked me, he said, like, what do you think about that? Um, about me getting 
that <laughs> ranking. Yeah, and so I was like, well, here's here's how I see it: is that so? Let's let's assume that I mean V one, two, and three, thirteen, fifteen, fourteen. It's basically the exact same thing. Um, top twenty. So I said that's what people see. Top right, twenty, the right. top top fifteen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I said to him that like you've been holding the same spot, and so it, in a way, it looks like you haven't. You've been stagnant, but really, like, there's so many new people playing. Like, there's the meta is constantly evolving. Like, to hold a position is also really hard. So, to me, I think you've like you're linearly improving. Like, if he was if he was exponentially improving, maybe he would have been top ten or that's, closer to top ten. That's a great way to look at it because you know, getting first at, for example, this Evo, right? Getting first at this Evo, majorly stacked, thirteen hundred people going. Getting first at this EVO versus getting first at Apex 2015. What was difficult yeah. then was, of course, like pre-patch city, pre-patch a bunch of things, uh, matchup inexperience. But what's difficult now is like optimized Bayo, optimized Rosa, optimized Marth and Cloud. So the fact that Mar Mars has been able to be relevant at that same spot the whole time is true. I mean, improving liter linearly this whole time like goes to show right. like he still got it, you know? Yeah, and I think the slight dip in his ranking is honestly just because of of lack of travel. Mostly, I think if he had gone to Gommel or Switchfest or any of those things, yeah, he you know it's tough to say exactly, but it's very likely he would have been um, a top sixteen again somewhere, at least a top thirty two somewhere. So sure, sure, sure. I'd, I'd I'd put him again, kind of the linear growth that he's shown in the past few years. All right. Yeah, yeah. I think like uh... Poppy. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I think a lot of us agree. I think Marsh knows himself that his actual peak is way higher than this. So I think Marsh himself is going to be satisfied with his ranking. I think uh, everyone, uh, or rather a lot of people, know that maybe with a little more traveling, Marsh can definitely break the top 20, just like before. Yeah, definitely. And he'll have like that publicity going into Ultimate when people are looking at the Zero Suit like move set discussion and you know what combos are whatever like they're going to be slamming that Nairo Choco Shaki Mars Twitter to like see like what, what what can we do is down throw still a thing is ladder still a thing you know so he's definitely going to be the zero, the zero suit like you know kind of like brand ambassador going into ultimate he'll have he'll have no trouble like getting all that attention so I I've noticed a trend between all of these past like five-ish players is that They've all been to less than like three S A tier events, three or less, all of them. Okay. Um, and all of them have this sort of one outlier result where they lose to Tweak and losers, or Mars here lost to um Komari Kiri and losers to get forty ninth. Um, it just like sucks that all of like you can't and not everybody can go to these huge events, or they just don't have the resources to. It's just, we're not, when, when Smash isn't big enough for all of these players to have such solid records against each other, I just, it's such a missed opportunity, I think. Yeah, the yeah. ideal world would be 100 tournaments where everybody goes, like, to every <laughs> single one, and then we Exactly 100. Out. Like, exactly, like, just, like, the most amount of data possible. But you'll have situations where one dude flies in, beginning of the season, top say, doesn't do anything until the end, then at the end gets, like you know, 13th. Then you'll have someone else like Vinny who doesn't do anything all season then gets ninth at like the second largest event, CEO. And so yeah, I mean, while people want to have the PGR reflect their biases, we can't appeal to every single one. Um, only because, like, again, if Ken doesn't travel, like, what are we going to do? Like, we can't make up or something yeah. for him. So I definitely see what you're saying, Card. Like, this 21 through 30 has that theme of, like, you know they can top 8, top 16 most large-scale events but at the same time like there's something always that's you know free agent status country status uh school or work life status that prevents them from doing that so um i definitely see what you mean there exactly Yo. It, it's just important to remember like in a way like this is a snapshot this isn't like and exactly how the game is now. forever yeah right yeah, yeah. It's it's just like just a a glimpse at a it's a, it's a calculated perspective it's of like, what's happening right now. It's like taking a picture inside a tornado, essentially. But yeah, Max, <laughs> you were gonna say something. 
Yeah, I'm going to hit you with a curveball. Do you think Mars attending Hyrule Saga and possibly even Frostbite hurt his ranking because of his placings? Because we had this conversation last Thursday where it was like, um, I think it was Fallen who was saying he specifically wouldn't have gone to a couple events because it would hurt his ranking more than it would help him. Or like, you know, he couldn't rack up big wins or whatever and would run the risk of potentially incurring some ugly losses or like low placements. 49th the Hyrule Saga, hardly the bar for Mars, right? But who did he lose to there? Uh, Meister and Winners, and then unfortunately, Komori Kiri also got upset by Diablo, so they there had to fight go. for 49th. Yeah. Hey, exactly. I knew it was going to be something ridiculous like that. And then if you look at Mars's wins, he has his first four right there are all top 15, dangerously close to top 10 wins. Light, I, I think, has a legitimate shot at being at the tail end of top 10, but probably will fall a little bit short of it ultimately. Either way, to Buzz, Light, Salem, Samsora. Especially in Season 5, these are ridiculous wins. And this is why, in my opinion, wins should be the most valued. Because a player who can beat these guys, just because he lost to Como, another shoe-in for top 10, top 15 territory, um, he seemed to have suffered a lot. And he also has great wins and placements at B and C tiers, Collision, uh, Immortal Tech, and Overclock. Third, first, and second, bro. Like, that. Like, damn, this this guy's good. And his X Factor is only plus two, which actually I think is crazy. <laughs> yeah, I don't know people how. People forget not. about Mars, at least in this season. So I, I can see right. that. Um, and his yeah. top 50 count, too, bro. And like five of those wins, five of the 11 wins he got are on ridiculous players. Like I was saying, you know, the first four are top 15, top 10. But I mean, Shuton's ridiculous, too. He's just ranked one below Mars. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I get that asked again, like I was telling Fallen, I get that asked all the time by. Uh, certain top players that are like, hey, should I attend this tournament? Is my rank at stake? Et cetera, et cetera. And that's where, like, in a vacuum, if he doesn't have Hyrule and Frostbite here, you take away the wins and losses that come about from that, and he just has his ninth at CEO, he's got his Collision, Immortal Tech, and Overclocked. You know, you're asking if this person can then break into the top 20 where everybody else has this attendance and stuff factored in from like a massive amount of like, you know, points and values that they get from these really high stakes events. Like, I don't know that you could break into the top 20 with anything less than what you're going to see. And for Mars case as well, like that assumes that everything else stays the same. That assumes that like Meister, uh, would be a bad win or Como would be a great win. And it's like how it shakes up at the end it's really hard to backtrack and say, like, if you cherry pick these things, would they go up or down? You know, if he didn't have the losses, strictly speaking, like, yes, he would go up. But, like, by how much, it depends. Because if he beat Meister, and, or, or sorry, since Meister beat him, the stock for Meister goes up. If Meister right. hadn't beat him, then the stock for Meister goes down. So it's like, how much would that have been worth? Um, so, yeah. Uh I think I think that kind of helps answer it because at the same time, like, you know, there's so much going on between these sets and placements. And like to address earlier, like it's not that placements are being overvalued um, because you said that's why the wins should be valued more. I mean, they're they're valued slightly in equal measure. I wouldn't say that placements are valued more at all. But for Mars's case, like, should he have stayed home? I mean, that's a question like I don't think we'll ever know the answer to because it's just assuming that everything else stays the same and that everything else would have worked out for him, like, unfortunately. Um, yeah, there's too many variables to determine whether or not that question would be answered with a yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a testament to real life. Like, you don't know what's going to happen. You just yeah. don't. Like, I've had top five players ask me if I don't go to this one event, will I keep my rank? <laughs> Well, whoever's below you, if they for some reason go on a tear and win the whole event, or the people above you like get sick and then in round one they lose and then they just like throw in the towel after that and they like end up at 65th with two bad losses, like then they're shuffling all around you. But if the people above you keep winning and the people below you keep losing, then sure, if you don't go, you'll stay the same. But like again, it's like. Uh, early bird gets the worm and whoever shows up is going to get rewarded and whoever shows up also consequently gets punished but like you're asking for si not you but people are asking for situations to be like almost devoid of risk which would basically then be gaming the system you know so right well it's not about necessarily being devoid of risk because like you said they're still running the risk that the players below them are going to catch up right um but it just seems like you know that's the the really big stain on Mars's record on this card, right? It's like 
everything else looks great. Even 17th at Frostbite. Well, again, you know, top 24 is not exactly the mark for Mars. Top 8 and just outside of it usually is where you'll see him land, right? But 11 and 11 versus top 50. Uh, plus 2 X-Factor. Like, third and higher at every C tier. Wins on multiple top 25 and higher and, you know, top 15 and higher players. I feel like I would have placed this guy, like, 18th minimum, probably. But okay. yeah. I, I don't know. Of course, I'm but one man. Uh, and, <laughs> you know, this is, this is just a snapshot again. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't know. I just feel like based on the criteria given to me, if I were, like, if someone said, hey, you're PG stats now. Where does this guy land? And you marked, you wiped away that 49th of Hyrule Saga, I'd give him a really high place. Okay. Fair, fair, fair. Um, you know, and, again, like, with the tweaks going every iteration, I think we're getting closer to making that, like, final... I mean, even then it won't be final, but like just like improving mm -hmm. as the scene changes. But again, not to dwell, you know, Mars is incredible and he, you know, is probably disappointed with the standard. But at the same time, 25th in the world, that that's great to have for the next couple months. Um, but to just keep things moving as we are hitting now the top of the hour, uh, 24th, we got Kamame. Any any strong opinions there? Kamame being kind of the weirdest person ever getting second at evo and then also dipping into the 40s but also living in japan but competing here i mean who who who's 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 team kamame i i'm not gonna lie kamame has actually been one of my favorite smash 4 player since even before he came to public light when he was known as kamamushi and kamamushi, only known yeah. for his activity as a mega man who would just do fancy metal blade combos really before they got popular and I'll never forget he had, how he had tweeted, I'm going to win Evo. This was like a week mm -hmm. and a half before Evo 2016, I believe. Yeah, wow. the one that Ally won? Yeah, the one that Ally Champions won. That Ally I mean, I'll, I'll be real. Out, in fact. I'll be real. Anyone who didn't want Kamehameha to at least win Evo a little bit just has no heart. <laughs> I, <laughs> you know, I totally did want him. The best part about it was at an event that weekend, right before Evo, he got like 87th or something because he went all random and Lucas. <laughs> and I feel like that is a little snapshot of how Kamehameha is as a player, hmm. where a lot of his placings and a lot of his style is very inconsistent, but there's an ultimate game plan to that that I feel is very much reflected in his history on the PGR. Yeah, also, Max, what do you make out of this? Ma uh, Mega Man, Chi, Cloud, Yoshi, all in the same player card? I mean, dude is wild, right? <laughs> So we, we were talking earlier about the viability of solo mains when we were speaking about Wrath, right? But we conveniently did not uh, revisit the topic after going through Zenodo, solo main, SDX, solo main, Shuton, solo main, Mars, virtually a yeah. I don't know who, uh, who he's actually beaten with his Falcon, right? And then we arrive at Kamehameha, who has four characters on his card, two of them being considered mains, right? So... This is, I think, one of the, the biggest philosophical questions in Smash 4. Do I just stick with my character, um, or do I branch out and try to conquer other matchups with different tools? And what... so if you look... Yeah, yeah, go on, go on. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, if you look at the top two players in the world, who I think, at this point, everyone knows who they're going to be, right? They have a really deep character pool. Their player cards are going to have four or more characters, maybe three or more characters each, right? And they do have wins with all of them. Leo even busting out Lucina all of a sudden. Yeah. Uh, to beat Rico and, and other people, Captain L. So, I don't know, man. Um, I don't think that that's exactly why they're the top two players in the world. Zero, pretty much Solomon. Diddy, pretty much Solomon. Sheik before the nerfs. I mean, they have. he has been known to bust out a couple characters every now and then, but hardly what you'd even call a secondary. Um, and then, you know, if you want to take a peek down your screen a little bit after Kamehameha, who's going to be on this ranking, another solo main and of a, a very questionable character. Same can be said for Shuton. Um, at least, you know, Mewtwo and Diddy are top tiers for, for SDS. And Zeno. But I don't know, man. Uh, I think it's, it's just like a, a real divide in this community is like, you know, do you stick it out with your main, tough out those matchups and inevitably like run into a couple bad ones? Or do you just fragment your attention, spread yourself a little thinner? Yeah, uh, and invest more time into other characters. The simple answer is I don't know. I'm a dual, <laughs> triple main myself. Yeah, it, it's I mean, very, Marth. it's very disparaging. And we'll go to you, Popey, in a second. But like, when you pick up a new character because this matchup's been just like really, 
rustling your jimmies, right? Like you cannot <laughs> handle big body boys like DK or Donkey Kong. So I'm going to go like ZSS or Cloud or something to like really take advantage of that, you know, big body. Like then you lose with that pick. Then you wonder, what am I doing here? Let me go back to the main. And people don't realize that you got to lose just as much with your co-main or even tertiary like like third main right but like it's interesting in Kamame's case because i'd argue that he's more of like the tweak side where tweak like really adapts to the meta and what it demands of him uh by having bayonetta cloud dk again for those really crazy matchup spreads but then mk leo is more of like at least like i see what's in common here like everything has a sword meta knight cloud lucina marth but kame has mega man she cloud and yoshi like what a motley crew you know like <laughs> that was just well, bizarre. yoshi sat there as a method of countering characters that would mess around with mega man so that's more of a legacy sure, than sure. anything else and yoshi still has his place because you could take advantage of really good aerial drifts surprisingly good frame data like yoshi he has his place amongst it but he's definitely the uh the dark horse of these picks cloud a bit more of a traditional pickup for the sake of supplementing a character but i feel like sheik is definitely the focus here yeah because she does mm -hmm. a lot more to supplement Mega Man's neutral and bad matchups and i feel like sheik's at least kamehameha's style of playing sheik is very similar to how he plays Mega Man, just utilizing the tools to to bully his opponents at any range so it's one of these aspects where like we gotta take we gotta step back and it's not just like how good of a Mega Man player is Kamehameha. It's how good of a Smash 4 player he is and why he's using multiple characters to supplement his own victories, not just him carrying Mega Man to the top, yeah. for, say, for example. Great I, exactly, I, exactly, I agree with Hangman in the sense that we have to look at why they're multi-maining. Uh, the disparity between these solo mains and multi-mains can actually be, like we can actually take a look at the context of why they're multi-maining. Uh, some people are solo maining because their character can, in one way or another, deal with most of the roster. But some people, like Omeime, who main Mega Man, a uh, character with so many polarizing matchups, are essentially forced to, or rather compelled to, pick up a secondary like Sheik to cover those matchups. So when looking at multi mains, I think we should look at the context of who they mained before. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, Mega Man had that big surprise pack factor like in the very beginning with a footstool and shield like all that stuff but it's kind of died down a little bit more i mean you'll see it every now and then when kamei does it and i even that had <laughs> uh max you were there when that happened to me at one of the xenos uh that, was, yeah. that i was at and like it catches people but like the thing about surprises they only work one time so like all the top players now know all right on shield kamei i'm not touching you you know uh, with a missed space aerial. But yeah, I mean, of course. Um, and, and just to like keep it going, like the next uh, ranking we have here, you know, 23 is Raito, who is a solo main, you know? And now we're talking about a solo main probably uh, gonna be the only duck hunt we're gonna see for a long time on any PGR. Uh, Raito, you know, like solo duck hunt. You know, and for anyone who's been able to commentate some of his matches, I mean, do you have anything to sort of say for Raito's case? Uh, you know, either surprised at this or disappointed with how low he is or, how, you know, maybe he's too high in your opinion. I mean, anybody want to go ahead and start on that first? My first impression that surprises me is how the X Factor is only plus one. Mm -hmm. I, I saw a lot of people rating Raito in their top 20. Like, not not like obviously top 15 but like in that 15 through 20 range i most lists that i saw of people like predicting this i had they had Rido in that range because he's gotten so many wins and i guess that's sort of like the recency because at the tail end of the pgr season he started doing a lot better yeah but i don't know man Rido's super good he's nasty yeah Max has something to say, or Doughboy? Yeah, I'm pretty surprised that he's only 23rd. I thought this guy was going to be very close to the top 15 territory, especially after CEO, man. What a run. He looked like he was going to be Leo for a while. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, we saw Lucina come out to play. So many forward smashes saved that <laughs> for him. But, I mean, just look at this guy's win list, though. Cosmos, almost certainly top 10 material. Fatality, probably just outside of it. Kamehameha, we just covered him. He's 24th. Larry... Has been top 10 every single season. Might fall out of it for the first time now. And Tweak, number two in the world. Like, you know, assuming that my guesses are correct. Top 10 so, in the world, arguably, sure. Yes. So, 
I mean, dude, like the guy has a crazy resume. The lowest he placed was within the top 24, you know, tied for 17th at any major the entire season. So to see him at 23rd seems very surprising. Like if there was a bracket, you know, technically he would have tied for 17th with Kamame and everybody up to number 16, right? So I, I don't know. It's just kind of shocking to me. And again, like um, it just it just makes me say even more like wins should be really the driving factor here and also you know after wins would be consistency in order of importance to me yeah and this guy's nothing but that you know only placing within top 24 and probably the people that he lost to 417th at the three tournaments that you know technically were his lowest placings and i guess evo japan as well i bet you anything those were god tier players that may have taken an early trip to losers so um yeah i don't know raito's a monster you just watch this guy play you asked about like you know commentating his sets he has probably the biggest brain in Smash 4. The way he's fighting with the can <laughs> the entire time. like he's, It's like he has the B button like mapped to his left pinky where he doesn't even need to be you know, manipulating his fingers like that would be doing other things. And he could just freely move it while he's doing whatever he wants. It's like it, it thoughtlessly moves for him. Um, and I think that really defines this guy's gameplay. He's always playing. He's playing like a team fighter. You know, he has an assist. Yes. A lockdown assist, a get out of jail assist. Um, it's literally like snakes, grenades, and brawl for everyone that draws that comparison. You know, it appears on frame one and can save you. You'll take a little damage, but it's better than getting comboed. Uh, and you can trade with your opponent. Any lighter characters are going to suffer. Dude, the guy's a monster. And with Duck Hunt, a character that pretty much everybody wrote off. By the way, for all the Diddy doubters out there, do you think Diddy Kong is worse than Duck Hunt? Like, this is exactly why I think <laughs> people are placing way too much weight on the, the PGR peaks of players. Yeah. Uh, and not even just results, but the peak player on the PGR, right? Like Duck Hunt, certainly not a character who is better than Diddy Kong or even nearly as good as Raito's placement reflects. Yeah. But the guy himself is just really talented and he can make it happen. Yeah, well, fun fact, all right? I'm not even trying Ooh. to be a certain way about this, but Raito did famously go 0-2 at Sumabato 24, uh, which to you might mean very little. But to draw the comparison, Sumabato 24 was a C-tier event and mm-hmm. he did go secondaries and then also he already qualified for this event uh as is like this event was leading into you know not getting like super technical like the entire structure but it, he was basically just competing for fun uh but things didn't go too well and he went oh and two now all right he was sandbagging so how could you count that against him all this other <laughs> stuff that becomes a situation where, like, all of a sudden other players are sandbagging, right, and right. now it gets crazy. But if you had DreamHack Austin, like, for example, Sam Sora going 0-2, that, that's the same scale we're talking about in terms of, like, how we had to interpret it. And even though, again, he was using secondaries, like, he didn't really put time into it, whatever, 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 it was still a result. It was still a data point. So, like... Everything you would say, like, it's not like he got super dragged down by that 0-2, but that 0-2 still stood. Because that is probably mm-hmm. the worst thing that can happen to you as a PGR player, aside from getting upset from someone named, like, Bonk or something. Like, hey, ha- Bonk is pretty good. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. Bonk's amazing. All right, aside from getting upset from someone like Hitaro or something at an event, <laughs> like... Oh, going, Hitaro is going, not, not as bad as you might think either. It's, <laughs> shots fired, right. shots fired. It's the meme factor, all right? I, love I know, Hitaro. I know, I know. Um, I know what you mean. Just but being, going 0-2, yeah. literally, like, I think the only person to go 0-2, like, almost, like, at a big scale event was Trella back at CEO. Like, he got 129th or something. He went, like, 1-2 or 2-2. But, like, that that's just your result right there. And so, like, j- just to, again, like, the player cards show the best of the player and I, and I guess, like, the rest of the player that, like, go, goes kind of unnoticed. But, like, again, he kind of went 0-2 at an event, and you have to factor that in. Um... Maybe you wouldn't say, like, oh, that should take him back five spots if I'm placing him in, like, my top 15. But at the same time, it's part of his reality as, like, a player, you know? And that's the no, way. How about this, man? How about we play this like a college course? You're a teacher. This is relevant to you. <laughs> what if we just drop the lowest placement for a player or the worst tournament performance every season? As I was thinking like, about that. So it's like a sandbag case. pass. You the know? problem here is that when I'm in a class and every student gets the same test – like on a set week for the same marking period not everybody here is taking the same test right so like some people mm-hmm. go to every major all right drop off the lowest major sure but other people like they only go to one major right so it becomes mm-hmm. like a huge 
quagmire of like dropping the lowest result all of a sudden this player gets inflated this is and that and then maybe if you hit a certain amount of attendance then you get the benefit of the doubt because like also you know you can be burnt out from travel or whatever i i just see like uh, it's literally just an idea i see a myriad of problems with it yeah yeah, yeah. so well, i'm glad you have an answer one season we did taper off like after your sixth event the less uh, like events beyond that start to count like a little tiny bit less uh i think that was v3 or v4 because like there was this like concern like zero narrow tier one sponsors they go to every single thing right in order to have the pgr not just be an attendance record thing like we need to taper off after six so we tried testing with that but this season attendance was like at an all-time low um so yeah driving the lowest tournament like can't be a thing but for raito's case i mean he still made it with solo duck hunt and that's like props to him you know Mm -hmm. um any other thoughts before we move on we're almost going to close out here i'm really excited i mean it's not to do with this pgr but i'm excited for Rido in ultimate like i don't know if he'll stay duck hunt or what but like i i just know he's going to be a monster and i'm amped for it yeah right out right sick um and speaking about sick players and not health wise uh wadi 22nd <laughs> mdva's own Couple couple things here. Uh, Wadi had that top 15 spot last season, coming from 46 the season prior, uh, and obviously his 21st when he first broke on. But Wadi, has anyone ever played him or commentated on one of his sets? Uh, I've gotten mm -hmm. an opportunity a couple of times at uh, Xanadu. Okay. How, thoughts? One uh, word to describe Wadi, and you can't use big brain. <laughs> Uh, big brain, big brain, brain like one word, like big bird. Actually, big bird's two words. <laughs> <laughs> big uh, brain, hangman. If I had to describe Wadi's play in one word, I would say dynamic, because he utilizes Mewtwo and and Rob very effectively. Uh, but how he utilizes their tools and how much varies from opponent to opponent. So you could look at Wadi in one set, where say for instance he's playing his rob against a local mdva player and how he's playing that rob he's sitting at the corner he's zoning out as soon as he gets within that percentage he goes in for the hunt gets the kill done and done or let's flip the script say he's playing his mewtwo it's against the likes of like the buzz or something all of a sudden he's right on top of him he's staying within his, right outside of his range he's looking to constantly tack on damage build up the pressure and so on and so forth it's the same person he could be doing this like from one from one match into the next round, and he could flip back and forth as much as he needs to. Okay, and, and other, I feel like oh, that's sorry. kind of reflected in his placements, where he places himself very highly, but it's still a bit more. Um, it wavers a bit further than where other players sort of range within that same area. Wadi, it's a lot larger of a range, I would say. What about his Rob? Anybody have a thought? Any thoughts on his Rob? I mean, his Rob. I've seen some setups that are just like ghastly. I miss seeing it as much as it used to be around, but personally, I like me too more. So I'm like, just as like a as a spectator, like I'm fine with it, but I do miss the Rob, like you're getting at. His Rob is wild. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll take a Mewtwo set over a Rob set any day, both Dang. to watch, cast, and fight. Um, actually, no, I'd rather fight Rob. <laughs> but <laughs> if I had to put one word on Wadi, it would be flowchart. Um, I think <laughs> this guy has right. the game broken down to a science and if i got three words to describe him it, they'd be simple but effective uh <laughs> this is not a guy who's doing perfect pivots shield drops any like advanced Did, techniques tweet, wave bounces, whatever. the other day that he like just discovered how to like normal get up like from getting knocked down or something or like he tweeted no like, that was no <laughs> i love no he, like tweet, he tweeted tweeted something he tweeted some sort of sam sora like iq tweet where it was yeah. like i just <laughs> learned you can pummel and grab and i never did that until like ceo 2017 like i know wadi for a fact said something like hey i never used to do this and now i started doing it and it's like something well, see everyone does He's definitely one of the players that I'm not surprised to say something like that. Like, obviously not because he's stupid, just because the way he plays is like, uh, oh, again, I, it's a I found the tweet, chart, by the way. He's got a down. What is it? What does it say? Confession. I have never done a neutral get up from getting hit slash tripped and actually didn't know how to do so until like a couple months ago. Don't oh at Oh my um, don't god. At <laughs> no. To be Number ultra 22 fair, in the world, to folks. Be, to July 23rd. To be ultra Everyone fair, like, good. that is pretty situational, but at the same time, like, Wadi, come on, man. Come on, man. <laughs> I 
Speaking oh, yeah. of people who didn't know, speaking of people who didn't know stuff existed in Smash, actually here in the Philippines there was a decently high level player who didn't know tilts existed until he was like two years into the scene already. You didn't know tilts existed? I didn't know wow. tilts existed. Was he good? I think I have to go. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I mean, like, you haven't seen the Philippines on any PGR, folks. I mean, I mean, oh. <laughs> 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 hey, hey, uh, there's, there's no Philippines event, Swar. I know. Yeah, that's why. That's why. You know how the major. Our, our upcoming major will be an ESA national tier, so I guess you could watch out for that. The ESAM and MVD are thinking of coming. Okay. Uh, I need. I need to see them get upset, uh, similar in an eye studying fashion of like this dark horse doesn't know how to tilt stick uh, situation. That would be crazy. <laughs> well, that's like uh, it reminds me. I can't remember his name, but there's the melee player who doesn't wave. Blob. Bar. Uh, yeah. Blob or Blarp? Oh, uh, yeah, Borp. It's Borp. 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 Yeah. Bad. yeah. Borp. No and, like, tech. All skill. He's still, like, sick. Big brain. But yeah. just doesn't but, yeah. do, like, one of the most important things. So it's just, it's so weird. And that's just where it goes to show, like, some people are just really good. And now, like, now imagine post neutral get up Wadi is going to be that much better. <laughs> yeah. Post neutral yeah, get gonna... up Wadi. <laughs> yeah. so bad. That's what I'm going to compare to Wadi. Um, if there was anyone in the world, it would be Borp, I'd say. Um, not a technical player by any means, but what this guy does is he'll start charging his Shadow Ball from, you know, any safe distance and just see what you do. And he's going to play off of that. And that's why I say he's a flow chart player because he knows Shadow Ball, you know, pretty much locks off X amount of options just by existing, right? And then he can play the response game from there. Um, and he's, he's just so polished at that. That's like hyper conditioning off a single move. That's exactly. Wild. I mean, it, it, there's a lot you can do off of it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think this all just calls to know the natural, the natural talent of Wadi, and like, bingo. Just, just what he's able to do with these characters. It's really playing off of reactions, seeing what his opponent's going to do, and just blowing them up on that instead of knowing like the technical prowess of how far his characters go. Because you like, you don't see him do anything hyper technical with Mewtwo and. You don't see him with like a smooth movement with his uh, Rob as some of the European Rob mains or even Ocean, even though Ocean's not very active these days. Yeah, but well, even like, big brain, what he can. yeah, <laughs> big brain, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, perhaps to Wadi. I know probably again having been in the top twenty and then not being in the top twenty stings, but nonetheless, congrats to him, and we'll see what he'll pull off uh, next time. But in the interest of time, moving on to now 21st, uh, everyone's favorite Pikachu main, Esam. Any thoughts at 21st, having top 8 at Genesis, 33rd at CEO, 13th at Gommel, and then some BNC tier wins, but you know some really great wins to sort of pad that. Uh, actually not moving at all from last season, so 21 Savage, Sam. That's... Uh, yeah, I actually... Yeah. I actually think it's a net positive that Esam's at 21st because of all of the new talent rising up. Okay, so sort of like, uh, who are we talking about? Mars. Mars with the linear growth. Yeah. Right. Okay. Where you said yeah, he's, he's kept his spot, them. basically. I mean, literally this time, but sort yeah. of even looking at the other PGRs. Esam consistently proves that he's like able to compete with the top-level competition consistently, and he's also able to keep it close with lower level competition consistently. That's not like a shot at him. He's like a staple in the top 30 at this point. Almost top 20. Literally. 21 the past two seasons, barely dodging it, but... I Yeah, and I think like, I think anytime people have made a top 20 list within the last year, they always put ESAM uh, right outside of top 20 because of that like lack of top four placements at like a major. Like some of yeah. the other top 20 players have. I mean, even with an X factor of zero, like people are in like in their mind, like 21 correlates to ESAM. So, you know, that's crazy. But it's still a measure of consistency. 21 today compared to PGRB1, I mean, totally different. Totally different. I feel like ESAM is quite literally, quite literally the gatekeeper to the top 20 because of how well <laughs> he's been able to keep along with his Pikachu in the advancing meta of Smash 4. Like, he's always been coming up with something new, always changing up how he's going to approach a game plan. And I feel like he, he's sort of garnered the uh, the title of being like a Bayo Slayer as of recent. Hmm. And that's I feel like that just show, shows like how well he's been able to stay 
where he is compared to where he was last year, where Bayonetta wasn't as prevalent. So the fact that he has not moved his position since, but as a player has been able to move with the changing tides of the scene, I think, I think it's a positive aspect to him. Yeah, I mean, there is also uh, that is a little bit of a double-edged sword because popularly tokening the phrase just SDI uh, has gotten him into a lot of trouble anytime he does get taken off the top. So, you know, Bayo Slayer in, in Steed, I'd say. But, you know, Isam definitely, like, being so aggressive, like, some Bayonetta players just can't handle it. Or even players in general. So, you know, props to him. Uh, any other reactions on Isam before we go to our picks for Wednesday? No, I'm pretty uh, unsurprised by this. I would Has have seen him between. Has done anything lately? I know it was like a really big deal during Civil War, and he's popped it out a few oh, times since then, but I don't know if doing anything in the current... Uh, oh, Samus? Region. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's It's been a minute. So, like, I'm a Samus me myself, so like, if I'm not watching a tournament and Isim goes Samus, like, I get like four DMs about it, and I'm like, oh god, I gotta watch this. So I haven't gotten the DMs lately, so I don't think <laughs> he's been doing it. I, I've um, seen uh, Isam in like the pool stages. Uh, right. Default yeah. to, to Samus a lot. We are again seeing that co-main, not co-main, but like having a character pool, um, because some some players have argued like getting through pools is sometimes more of a challenge. I mean, it's not more of a challenge than getting through top eight, but it's still very difficult when you don't know. Like, you know Mr. R. Sheik, you know, like, how to play against it somewhat. But, like, when you sometimes get, like, a player that you've never seen before, like a hidden boss, like, some players default to using other characters for that instead of their staple, like, Pikachu or, like, Rosalina, for some cases, like, the Buzz. Um, so, yeah, I've seen it as, like, a tool against pools, you know? Like, like it's Karin. What'd you say, Popey? Like it's, like it's Karin. Yeah, yeah. We've even seen that too, like, uh, who had another popular, like, secondary? I mean, like, in the very early days, like, you know, there was situations where, you know, Void had, like, a Fox, and then, like, you know, with Larry's, like, Rise with DK, like, you'd see those picks, like, kind of fly out in pools, and it's because, like, you know those characters are comfortable in a pool situation, uh, and top tiers can kind of, like, almost, like, uh, screw themselves over sometimes because they're so popular and everyone knows how to play against them. So, um, definitely, definitely. Uh, final thoughts before we move on? I feel like out of the entire PGR for this season, I feel like 30 through 21 is the one that people can argue the least over. I feel like everyone who's here kind of, like, belongs here. Okay. Like, neither is a good or bad thing. Just sort of, like, I feel like these are the types of players that are expected to... Not to reuse the phrase, but gatekeep in a way. And I feel like the only one who could kind of be a surprise would be maybe Raito. But if you followed how Raito's done, he's definitely like explained why he should be placed as well as he is. And then like, if you're not aware of sure. SDX, then yeah, he's the he's the surprise guest, I would say. I go with Mars, too. I'm surprised yeah. that Mars is in top 20. There was one thing I wanted to bring up with Mars. And so I feel like this is just an in general um, assessment of the current season or the passing season is I feel like Mars is definitely a cautionary tale to the value of B and C tier events. Coming into this into V5, I was really worried that the way that events were being scaled, that Bs and Cs, because there's going to be so many of them, they may not have been as valuable. Mm -hmm. And Mars, as we had already discussed, he didn't travel uh, far for out, out of the Northeast for many events. But he was active within uh, New England, within Tri-State. And the losses that he had taken there, I feel, are another aspect to how he got his placing. Mm -hmm. And definitely. that should definitely be noted in the discussion of players where how active they are at home and the events that take place at home has just as big of an impact on how often they get to travel. Yeah, I mean, again, about 80% of the events this season were B and C tier, way more than the previous season. So like, while the A plus and the A's definitely weigh a bunch, like there's definitely like they're the minority and naturally because of the pyramid like situation of when you're looking at these tiers but like elsewhere the bnc tiers counted more because there was nothing really to outweigh them compared to last season with like just so many a tiers and s tiers back to back um and we didn't even reach like the new established threshold for s tier um, because it was set like arguably higher than what was achievable but again we were kind of like bracing for impact compared to last season um, but yeah, Mars definitely did work at home, and so did a lot of these other players, and that'll like come to show like next time like if there's a B or C tier, like 
you know, don't dodge it. But at the same time, if there is a BNC tier and you do do poorly, for example, like Raito, because I did notice, or sorry, I did note that he, you know, went 0 and 2, but he also got like 33rd um, at like another Sumabato, a qualifier rather. And that hurts at like, especially those events, because people expect these PGR players to get like top three at a B or C tier. To get anything lower than that, like, is decimating, because you know that it happened as a result of like non-PGR players be beating them or like them not getting any good wins. So great point that you brought up, Hangman. Um, but for the final part now, since we did run an hour and a half, um, I actually turned off the layout. Um, the last part of this will be the predictions because I think we had a good amount of Q&A throughout this, especially Max, you had some great questions, Doughboy as well. Um, off the top of your head, 11 through 20 is on Wednesday. 11 through 20 has been confirmed, or sorry, 1 through 20 has been confirmed to be the likes of like, you know, obviously we have the duality that is Tweak and MKLeo in the top 10, or the top two rather, uh, that many people are arguing. And then we have like, is Void going to be top 10? Is Light going to be top 10? But for 11 through 20, like, starting with you, Popey, what you would hope to see since you have been a part of the process um, who would you be happy with getting a spot in the 11 through 20, given this entire season, given their history, given the overall climate of the scene, who would just like really make your day scoring a spot in the 11 through 20? Well, for me, someone who I'd really like to see rise up the rankings is Fallen because for the longest time in Smash Force history, he's just been so underrated since the start of the game's history. So him ending the competitive lifespan of the game, finally like, breaking into public, uh, like being one of the considered one of the greats would be a great way to end the game, uh, the Smash 4 as a whole. Yeah, and, and seeing is believing, because like, of course, like Fallen has not been revealed today or last Thursday or last Tuesday, and obviously he's not in Area 51. Uh, so I think it's safe to say he made it into top 20, but, you know, it's definitely cool to see him uh, land it, you know, at least as far as that. Uh, what about you, Max? I can tell you who I don't want to see in the top uh, 11 to 20 tomorrow. Okay. And that would be Light and Mr. R. I really hope that they clinch a top 10 spot, but I don't I don't know if it's possible. I think they'll be toward the uh, the higher end, though. Early so, teens? Early teens? Yeah, early teens or, or not even teens, you know, oh. 11 to 12. Um, True. So yeah. that would be great to see them, especially Light, man, going up what? What was he, 47th last season? Around there, yeah. High 40. Yeah. Okay. And Over then, 30 spots. And then, and then, of course, you know, the, uh, what was it? The VGBC boot camp happened where he just, like, got super hot really quick. And then people <laughs> were like, nuts. you know, but again, invitational environment, that's a story for another time. Uh, but anyone you would be happy to see in 11 through 20, at least, knowing that they haven't been revealed so far? Uh, yeah, I'd like to see, um, hmm. I'm just looking at, like, you know, a projected list that... I have, and I, I think I'm pretty proud of Lima for coming all the way, and I know that's going to catch a lot of flack, right? Like, he's a Bayonetta player, and one of the most notorious for, like, his attitude and his demeanor and stuff, but Great I like Lima. I think he's hilarious. I think we need more people in the scene like him. He's just so, like, snippy and, and not afraid <laughs> to say, you know, the mean things that either everyone is thinking or maybe just that he's the only one sick enough to come up with. <laughs> so, that was the Lima, man. He, he definitely makes Smash 4 a more fun environment, regardless of what you think about the kid's character. He is definitely the man. So, um, yeah, I mean, everyone else is pretty much going to be who you expect, right? Like, Mr. R, one of my closest friends, in not just Smash, but, like, overall. IRL. So I, yeah, exactly. Um, Light, a player who has definitely made a fan out of me recently. Hmm. And he's close to home. And, yeah, Lima just... Guy's hilarious. So I gotta give him credit for that. Got it, got it, got it. And Doughboy, you log on to Twitter.com on Wednesday. You see this name and you feel butterflies in your stomach. Who is it? Oh, it's light. It's definitely light. And yes. having having seen light from the New England standpoint, I have a I have like uh, a couple sets on light from Gums. You know that, right? I believe it. I that's believe crazy. it. And that's where like I I remember. I don't even know what Gums it was or who I was teaming with, but. Uh, I think he was teaming with Ling Don. Ling. Yeah, oh, Don okay. is his. No, nah, not not Ling. Not oh, Ling. Just Dom, yet. I know the other guy, the Mario. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yep. Don. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's like a head boss. Um, he's whack. Like, he's whack so good. good. Like whack. He's he's, he's good. He's a goofball. I love him. Yeah. Um, but with light, like, 
Oh, and it was the last Soth, which was Smash on the Hill, one of the Boston events before. Yeah, right. Like by the clock patch happened. Good old, good old TMPR. Um, but like, I played against Light, and I brought him to game three, and I was freaking out about that. But like, now, like, I don't know if I could take a stock, and it just like his growth has been wild. Yeah, and he definitely deserves like. Hopefully single digits, but like I could definitely, I'd still be amps and still think it's like a valid range that he would been be in like the, I guess we'll call it the tweens or 10. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if he gets a sweet 16, that'd be hype, but everybody <laughs> wants that top 15 spot, you know? Yeah. Uh, what about you, Card? Um, Elegant, honestly, because I feel like people haven't been recognizing <laughs> Elegant as much as he was like the season before. Yeah. Because the season before he was making all these runs, That's right? That's a lot to really follow. Your own act at 11th, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, his own act at 11th and where he got, he almost won a major. He almost, he, he's done so much. My heart. Um, And this past season, it's been more like, do good at regionals, get 13th at majors, get 9th at majors, get, get some top 8s. Uh, do good consistently, um, which I'm really proud of. And also, Fatality, uh, ending his mark with the top 20. Really hope he's top 10. I don't know if the tail end of his season is good enough for a top 10, um, but he is done with locals for the most part and most yeah, majors. There, there is that tweet from Fatality announcing his Smash 4 retirement into Ultimate uh, coming out, I think, this past weekend. He's kind of like just done. So Yeah, I, I, I blame Wrath. Um... <laughs> <laughs> He'll be around, he said, at Locals, but he said he's done traveling, yeah. competing, everything. And for Fatality, that's obviously a personal decision him. you got to respect. But, you know, I, we'll be missing him on the stream, uh, Giphy Cat, Twitch clips, Reddit threads, because he this, always this, destroys people, you know? This past um, local season has been pretty rough for him. He hasn't really won any locals. He's been losing to Sunito and Wrath, and it's just like Sonic Bayo, Sonic Bayo. It's, it's hard for him, dude. Yeah, definitely. Uh, <laughs> meta woes. And finally, Hangman, person you'd be happy to see. Um, I'm gonna just go ahead and gonna go on the light train because I've been watching, I've been traveling a lot between Tri State and New England for events and seeing light grow from a player who is like, hey, this kid's kind of good. He plays really well, but then he doesn't really get the placements to, to, to match that. And then seeing him rocket to where he is now, I feel like he just needs that, that final seal of approval, place him high up. I would love to see him break the top 10, but realistically, uh, I think he's going to be in the high teens. I have a bet going that he's going to be number 14. <laughs> so I'm hoping for that specifically. But oh nonetheless, God. I feel like he's, he's an amazing player, great personality for the scene. And to see him get placed highly, I think would just be fantastic. Yeah, I remember a couple shines ago. It might have been the first shine where Light was just sleeping on his pool. He was kind of like, ah, it'll be fine. If you've ever met Light, I mean, he's so... Like, not dismissive, but he's just so, like, just relaxed, you know? Like, nothing really gets to him. And he's also, like, a huge, like, clown and jokester. But he was like, ah, no one in my pool really, you know, really concerns me. And then I believe he lost to Z, the Canadian Mewtwo. Uh, <laughs> and then he, I think, ended up drowning. And then the second shine, that's where he beat Void. Who's light? What's going on? That ain't Larry rolling up the sleeves. What's going on? You know, so people were <laughs> popping <laughs> off. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's his trademark yeah. thing. Just like this, he's got to do this during the set, you know, right? So light yep. definitely uh, then being placed in the top 50 last season. I remember he asked me on Facebook, you know, before the top 50 went out. He's like, "Where am I starting?" I was like, I "Can't tell you. Like, gotta wait till tomorrow." And then the next day, you know, of course, like it comes out, and then he had that whole VGBC boot camp where a lot of different players were there for a lot of different reasons. Some for glory, other to, others to chill. I think I remember Zero specifically, kind of just let the match go with salem for example people are just like this is just for fun uh but light really popped off at that event but unfortunately it didn't count um but you know it's cool to see him in the top 20 uh potentially top 15 potentially top yeah, 10. I, it just has to point out one of my favorite quotes about light that speaks to his personality mars's girlfriend okami swan once tweeted 
Light and Mars are two halves of the same idiot. And I thought that was <laughs> so funny. I, so I told accurate. her, like, uh, that directly reminds me of uh, Angel and Dakota, the rapture. Like, if you get those two in a room together, one, you'll probably regret it very quickly. But two, you'll at least <laughs> enjoy it. You know, you'll laugh about it later. But yeah, I don't know. Uh, those guys are really oh, fun. Man. Really Knowing fun. all three people that you just mentioned and how they would, like, yeah, just uh, Okami would... would say exactly that and that is exactly correct yeah he, <laughs> he did win the player's ball which is really hype uh, he did yeah he forgot about that prom hey, king. King right there prom king, Dude, he yeah. was looking fresh too I, i'm glad someone who like particularly looked really good in like you know dressed really really well um won the event that was sick did you see Just coney's like... tweet saying how everybody yeah. at the players ball looked like they were interns for dunder mifflin that was yeah dude <laughs> <Heavy> <laughs> shots, that, really man, that was literally uh, dude I, I dropped dakota off Right after the uh, the event, and we watched The Office in his house, which is like the classic. It's always on, and at, it was the one where, like, at the end, it's like I learned that a ream of paper is three hundred sheets. And then the girl next to him goes, "I thought it was five hundred. I think, it's, oh, well, I guess I didn't learn anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's The Office. Oh, what a great uh, show. But yeah, no hype event, hype player. I think everybody named someone that uh you know people really rally behind and that's why i personally like top 20 the most in terms of reveal because 21 through 30 is basically the yeah i really can't argue that like we were saying earlier attendance acts of god uh school life work gets in the way uh 31 through 50 is like super weird because again people that don't travel make it on people that you know go like to all sorts of events make it on but their win wins or placements aren't that good so one through 20 those are the household names and these are the names we're going to be seeing for the rest of the year which is really hype um i think that'll close out the show if we want to go ahead and start with shout outs starting with hangman ending with popey uh anyone you want to thank anyone you want to shout out as we now close the show and head into the reveal of 11 through 20 now on wednesday hangman um, I'll give a quick shout out to just the entire New York Smash scene. It's it feels more like a connected family than it does like a group of people who want to play video games. And it's really because of them that I've had the interest to like look into stats, look into production, look into what makes an event good and want to be involved with so much. So just shout outs to everyone in New York. Yeah, Max they've included. super welcoming so far. I'll vouch for that. And I'm, I'm sure Max is going to ultra vouch. But yeah, let's go New York. <laughs> card shout outs anyone uh, to thank highlight whatever uh shout outs to wrath for making it all the way up here onto the pgr shout outs to peebnut for being my boy hang out in the chat <laughs> uh and shout outs to recursion you're going to be seeing a lot more of us uh pretty soon i'm starting to stream the smash 4 weekly and the melee bi-weekly with the recursion setup that's and cool. we're going to be making a lot of big waves a lot of big events for recursion in ultimate georgia smash in general Great scene. If you're in the Georgia area or near the Georgia Southeast area, should come out. We're we're very open uh, group of folks. Yeah, and I'll add on to that. If you're not starting your local scene now, good luck doing it when Ultimate happens because it's going to be crazy. So build up those bracket, like, you know, bracket nomenclature, like having your weekly and then the number and then whatever and your streams and all that social media because it'll be super important. So big ups to you, Card. That's awesome to do it from now until then. Uh, also, shout outs to uh, Team Card in Georgia. What's good, I love Card. you guys. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right, Doughboy, what's good? Um, one shout out to you for asking me to be on this, and shout out to everyone. Let's go, me. Who's? <laughs> Let's go, Spar. Uh, shout out to you guys for the awesome discussion about this. This was really cool and uh, insightful, and I'd say personally, I learned a little bit and think about things a little differently now, which is cool. Um, shout out to. Beyond the Summit, who just gave me a job. Shout out to Tuxedo, who sponsors, um, who I'm going to shout out myself now, my stream. That's kind of been my push lately. So I'll probably be streaming Smash after this if anyone wants to keep the conversation going or tell me how wrong I was and how right Max was, etc. Um, awesome. But yeah, awesome time. Cool. Thanks. Max, shout outs, thank Wait. yous. Wait, what was I right about that you were wrong about? Just probably everything. Wait, what? <laughs> I don't know where this is coming from. It feels like shots. I just, I just feel you. No, no, no. You're, to me, you're just like one of the most like knowledgeable people in the community. Period. So like, oh, dude, I'm. Glad as soon as I, I say something that's different you than you, I'm like, Max, why am I wrong? Though? Have you met Max? Yeah, I was gonna Ooh. say, I'm glad I can uphold that illusion because I clearly just <laughs> spent enough time with me. 
I am a, I'm a big brain through and through. Shaboy. <laughs> yeah, big brain shaboy. But anyway, guys, uh, yeah, I just want to shout out not just the New Jersey or New York or Tri-State Smash community, but the entire Northeast who really came through yesterday for Players Ball. That was like an amazing time. I felt, you know, even though I wasn't playing in the tournament, I think I had more fun than anybody else there. Um, well, 100% sober the entire day. Almost definitely. Uh, by the way, for Almost the record. Definitely. Had a glass of wine in top eight. But yeah, shout out to everyone who supported that. Shout out to Swar, who I'm about to see in real life in like an hour. <laughs> and uh yeah uh thanks for having me on guys and and thank you all for contributing to this discussion um everyone always points out something that there's no way i would have mentioned by the way the thing i want to mention is i feel like mexican players kind of got the short end of the stick on this pgr because uh mm. the event that everyone pays attention to in their country is smash factor where all the invaders come and you know occupy a bunch of that top eight um those top eight spots whereas japan you know they they kind of got like a their own system Ecosystem. for this one yeah, so yeah, yeah i just wanted to just wanted to shout out the mexican smash community those guys are really strong and i hope that uh future pgrs could put a little bit more eyes on them but that's all i got okay okay fair fair uh popey last but not least yeah just shout outs to all the tos who are making events that are pgr events because without all the tos in the scene we probably wouldn't even have a basis for rankings in the first place Ooh, yeah that's a sleeper, true story sleeper right there yeah shout outs to all the TOs, the likes of uh, She, Vaseth, Bear, Tantalus, Super Smash Con TOs, uh, Midwestern TOs, SoCal TOs, Champ, of course. Uh, local scene, regional scene, national scene, you all matter. So thanks for what you do. Um, and yeah, I think that's the end of our show. Again, you've been uh, presented with the PGR Roundtable 4v5, 21 through 30. Featuring myself, Swar, Popey, Max, Doughboy, Card, and Hangman. We'll be back again on this Twitch channel this Wednesday, same time, same place, twitch.tv slash global. We'll see who gets revealed and how many wishes came true based off of this discussion. Uh, I look forward to it. Keep an eye out for it. And uh, yeah, we'll be seeing you next time. So take it easy. Have a good night. Have a good night. Yes.